Yeah, so we are on camera. So good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming and uh, welcome to the first uh, online colloquium this semester, organized by the IIT Mandi Institute Colloquium Committee. It is my pleasure to welcome our speaker today, Dr. Stephen Thompson. Dr. Stephen Thompson is currently a Marie Curie uh, Fellow at the Freie University at Berlin on the European Commission project, Ergodicity Breaking in Quantum Matter, working in the group of Professor Jens Eiser. He has uh, previously been a postdoctoral researcher at the Collège de France, working with Dr. Marco Schiro, postdoctoral researcher at the Center of Theoretical Physics, uh, Ecole Polytechnique, working with uh, Professor Laurent Sanchez Valencia, and the Institute of uh, Theoretical Physics, uh, CEA Paris Saclay, also working with uh, Dr. Marco, Marco Shiro. His uh, main research interests are the uh, non equilibrium dynamics of strongly correlated quantum systems in the presence of quenched random disorder, particularly many body localization and quantum glasses. He is currently particularly interested in developing cutting edge numerical methods with a focus on unitary flow techniques and tensor networks. He lives and works in Berlin, Germany. So I happened to meet Stephen in a workshop some years ago, uh, apparently seven years ago, that's what we realized today. <laughs> when long I heard, time, isn't it? Yeah, long time. <laughs> so when I heard about his research and the, for the first time, and uh, I was much younger then, and I couldn't follow his talk all along the way, I must accept at this point, Stephen. But uh, today, gives me, uh, today gives me another opportunity. And if I'm still not able to keep up, I will console myself and think I'm still young. So that's what I would say. So, <laughs> so thanks again, Stephen, for accepting our invitation. The floor is now yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the uh, kind invitation to be here and for the introduction. OK, so today I would like to tell you a little bit about the physics of spin glasses. Now, um, I'm trying to keep this talk fairly accessible. You'll be happy to hear. Um, I'm trying to do this with as little math as possible. So hopefully there will be a lot of pictures, a lot of physical insight, intuition and discussion, and we'll try and keep it light on the, the really serious maths. So if you can all see me and hear me and everything is okay, then we'll just get started and we'll proceed. Yeah, all is good. Perfect, okay, right. Then let's start with a little bit of background about what it is that I'm going to be talking about and why. So, as many of you will probably know, the Nobel Prize in Physics this year was awarded for contributions to our understanding of complex systems. The award itself was a little bit surprising, in fact. It was divided in half. One half was awarded to Siyukuro Manabe and Klaus Hasselmann for their work on climate change, essentially, the work studying the Earth's atmosphere. And the other half was awarded to Giorgio Parisi for the discovery of the interplay of disorder and fluctuations in physical systems from atomic to planetary scales. Now, I think a lot of people were quite surprised to see this division, that on the one hand we had climate science, and on the other hand we had a man who was mostly known to me for his studies of spin glasses, of uh, disorder in solid state materials. But it turns out, in fact, there are some deep connections between the two halves of this prize. And the overarching theme here is the study of complexity, of highly complex interacting many body systems doing things that are a little bit unexpected. So here today, I'm going to focus on the Parisi share of the prize, the interplay of disorder and fluctuations, because that's the field that I work in. So this is the part that I know most well and the part that I find most exciting. And before we get too far into it, let's break down what does this actually mean? What does it mean when we say the interplay of disorder and fluctuations in complex systems? So the first thing to look at here is what do we mean by a complex system? Normally, what we mean by complex systems are the study of many body effects. So either in quantum systems or classical systems, when you have a large number of particles, a large number of degrees of freedom all interacting with each other, how do they behave? Uh, if you think about solving, for example, solving the Schrodinger equation, you can solve this exactly for one hydrogen atom, but as soon as you start having tens of atoms, hundreds, thousands, we can't do anything exact anymore. We have statistical mechanics, which can help us get some of the way there, 
but you can no longer have access to exact solutions. These, com these uh, problems are incredibly complicated. The second aspect is disorder. So disorder means that we have some kind of random impurities in our system, and the key word there is random. If we want to be able to predict material properties with some certainty, or if we want to understand the behavior of these random complex systems, we need to somehow systematically study this randomness. And that's a big challenge because random systems, by definition, sometimes behave in very random ways that are hard to describe, hard to explain, and hard to understand. The third aspect of this are fluctuations. Now, in this particular context, by fluctuations, we mean dynamical fluctuations. We mean things that are changing in time. These systems are not static. They evolve. They change. So to really understand how these disordered complex systems behave, we need to look at their non-equilibrium dynamics. Now, individually, each of these are already hard problems by themselves. The field that Parisi works in combines all of these together, and it's an extremely hard problem. You may then ask, why are we doing this? Why are we making our lives difficult? Why do we want to study all the hardest problems all at once? And the answer is that actually, we need these to understand the real world around us. The real world is messy. The real world is complex. It is disordered. And the real world does change over time in quite dramatic ways. Ultimately, that's the reason why Parisi's half of the prize connects to the other half of the prize on climate change and atmospheric modeling. The same principles that can be developed for the studies of spin glasses and solid state materials can also be used to understand vastly different processes such as the Earth's climate. We're not going to talk about the climate much here. We're going to talk about Parisi's work on spin glasses. But before we get into that, I think it's worth talking about what is, what is glass? Just regular, normal, everyday glass. What actually is glass itself? So to talk about that, I think the first thing that's useful to think about is in a lot of condensed matter and solid state physics, we deal with solids which are crystalline. So in a crystal solid, we have the atoms that form some kind of regular, ordered, periodic array, a crystal lattice, let's say. So we think about solids as being these nice, neat little grids of atoms arranged in some highly structured way. There are some exceptions to this, though, and glass is one of those. Glass, in everyday normal window glass, is not a crystalline solid. Glass is amorphous. This means that the atoms don't form a perfectly ordered crystal lattice. The atoms are kind of frozen a little bit randomly in space, as in this uh, little sketch here. In fact, glass is it's almost like the atoms are in a liquid and they just suddenly stop moving. They're not in an ordered periodic state. They're kind of randomly moving around, and then they just stop. So glass is a solid that has no crystalline order. And this means that a lot of our normal tools don't work. You can't use uh, the periodicity of a lattice. You can't just solve everything in Fourier space. Suddenly, a lot of our normal tools don't work for understanding glasses. And in fact, this is what makes them really interesting and very complicated. Um, you may be familiar with this sort of myth that uh, glasses are in fact kind of just a very slow liquid. And if you look at very, very old windows, let's say in churches or in old buildings, the windows are thicker at the bottom than at the top because the glass is kind of flowing like a liquid and pooling at the bottom. Now, this is not strictly speaking true. Uh, old windows are thicker at the bottom due to manufacturing techniques, not because glass is a slow liquid. But there is some merit to this point that um, glasses are kind of intermediate between the way we normally think of a solid and the way we normally think of a liquid. And this gives them some very interesting and unique properties. Now, we're not going to talk so much here about everyday glass from now on. Here we're going to talk about spin glasses. Spin glasses are magnetic analogues of this. So spin glasses occur in materials where the atoms themselves do arrange themselves in this nice periodic crystal structure, but their spins, their magnetic fields, are arranged in a very, very random way. So let's, uh, let's sort of introduce the context that we're going to be working in here, okay? First off, 
I want you to think about a one-dimensional chain of quantum spins. So again, by spin, what I'm really referring to is the magnetic field of the individual atoms. We're going to take a one-dimensional chain of spins of atoms, and we're going to say that they have an antiferromagnetic coupling between them, which we'll denote by this J. Now, what this means is that the atoms next to each other want their spins to anti-align. That's what we mean by antiferromagnetic. So if I line my atoms up in a 1D chain, I say that I have an antiferromagnetic coupling between them, then this chain has a more or less unique zero temperature ground state, okay? We have this antiferromagnetic order where the spins arrange themselves in a stagger formation going up, down, up, down, and they repeat like this. And it's unique up to some kind of global rotation of the spins, but we'll not get into that. The idea here is that there is an ordered state that if you cool this spin chain down, there are no thermal fluctuations, there's no noise, no randomness. This chain takes a nice, neat, ordered magnetic state. So this is true if we have antiferromagnetic couplings on a 1D chain. Now, what about if I think about putting these atoms in a 2D lattice and I take a 2D triangular lattice? So, ah, no, sorry. Before we get to the 2D triangular lattice, let me just introduce first how we're going to talk about the energy of these systems. So one of the main points when we're looking at spin glasses and looking at spin configurations, we're going to be interested in what is the energy of this spin configuration. We're going to be looking for the lowest energy configuration that we can find. Now, this is called the ground state. Now, there are two ways that we can measure this. Now, for those of you who are mathematically inclined and have a bit of background in quantum mechanics, you'll probably be familiar with the idea of Hamiltonians. So the Hamiltonian here just counts the spins. The spins here are denoted by the sigma i. We look at the spins, we look at which direction they're pointing in. We're going to look at easing spins, which are either up, plus one, or down, minus one. And all we do here is the Hamiltonian goes along the chain and says, if two spins are aligned with each other, we get a, an energy of plus j. If they're anti-aligned, we get an energy of minus j. For those who are maybe not so comfortable with, uh, with Hamiltonians or with the maths of it, we can also do this visually. So if I draw you a spin chain here, we have an antiferromagnetic coupling. That means that every time I have two spins that are anti-aligned, I get negative j. So we lower the energy. We're happy. We get a negative energy. Every time the spins are aligned with each other, we have to pay an energy cost of plus j. So here I sketch some particular spin configuration. Every time we've got two anti-aligned spins, we have a green bond. This bond is happy. This bond is satisfied. We lower the energy. Every time we have two aligned spins, it's red. This bond is not satisfied, and we pay an energy cost. So depending on how comfortable you are, you can either think of all of this stuff in terms of the math of the Hamiltonian, or for most of what we'll be looking at, I'm just going to be drawing these pictures of spin chains and highlighting the bonds that lower the energy in green and the bonds that raise the energy in red. This should become more clear as we go on. So now we get to the triangular lattice. I want to do the same thing. I want to play the same game. I want to put my spins in a triangular arrangement in real space, and I want every spin to be anti-aligned with its nearest neighbor so that I can get the lowest energy configuration. And I pretty quickly run into a problem because let's say I start with the spin at the top. I point it in an up direction. I can choose any direction I want. I can choose up. I know then that my next spin has to be down because I want them to be pointing in opposite directions. But then this spin also has to be down so that it's anti-aligned with the top spin. But then I have a problem here because it's these two are aligned with each other. So this costs me an energy J. This bond is not satisfied, this bond is not happy. Okay, how do I fix this? Well, you might say, let's try flipping one of these spins. No dice. <laughs> if I flipped this spin, the bottom bond is now satisfied, but now this one here is not. Now the bond between the top and this one on the right is no longer satisfied. So I can keep playing this game. I can keep flipping spins and trying to find a configuration where all of these bonds are satisfied, where all of the spins are anti-aligned with each other. And you pretty quickly will see that it's not possible. Because of uh, the geometric arrangement of these spins in real space, there is no way that I can arrange these spins, which I only allow to point up or down. There is no way I can arrange them in a configuration where all three of these bonds are happy, where all 
combinations of spins are anti-aligned with each other. This is called geometric frustration. So because of the geometry, the real space layout of these atoms, uh, there is no way that I can satisfy all the bonds at the same time. Now, what this means is that there is no unique ground state in my system. These four configurations that I draw on the slide here, they all have exactly the same energy as each other. And none of them are completely, completely happy. None of them satisfy all of the bonds. This means that we have a lot of degenerate states. So you can imagine scaling this up instead of having three spins, let's say I have 300 or 3000 spins, suddenly you have a huge number of combinations, all of which have the same energy as each other and none of which give you a unique ground state. So frustration in a material leads to an awful lot of complexity. You no longer can talk about a single ground state and you now have a huge manifold of states that are all equivalent to each other. Now, so far, we haven't talked about any disorder. This is purely uh, geometric frustration because I'm insisting on putting these spins into triangles. We can play the same game with random disorder on a square lattice. So now we're going to do a similar thing. But instead of having an anti-ferromagnetic coupling, now I'm going to allow my coupling to change signs. So we're going to have a plus J coupling, which will be an orange. Now this coupling means that if two spins are coupled by a plus J coupling, then they want to be pointing in opposite directions to each other. We're gonna have a minus J coupling in blue. If two spins are coupled by a blue line, they want to be pointing in the same direction as each other. So I take a two dimensional lattice, and now I'm going to just distribute my couplings entirely at random across the lattice. Okay, so some of these bonds now are ferromagnetic, some are anti-ferromagnetic. That means some of these bonds want the spins to align, some of them want the spins to anti-align. So now we can imagine populating this lattice with our spins. Let's start in the top left corner and let's pick a direction. We'll pick an up spin to start with, why not? Now, the next one, okay, if we come down this left-hand side, it's a blue bond, so these spins want to be aligned. That's easy enough. The next one is a blue bond, we want the spins to be aligned. The next one is an orange bond, so now we want them to anti-align. So far, so good, everything is happy. If we start the next column, we want this next spin to anti-align with the one beside it. We now want it to align with uh, the spin below and anti-align with the one next to it. This is possible. Again, we can do the next spin and everything so far is fine. And then suddenly we have a problem here because this next spin to satisfy all the bonds has to be aligned with this upspin and also aligned with this downspin. And that's not possible. So we have to pick one of the two directions at random. We cannot satisfy both of these bonds. You can keep playing this game and you can fill out the entire lattice in this way. And then if you look through it carefully, what you'll find is that there are a number of bonds that are not satisfied here. For example, this one that I talked about, the spins should be aligned, but they can't be. Uh, there's another one up here that's the same. And in fact, there are many of these bonds that I cannot satisfy. It doesn't matter which direction I put these spins in. If I flip one of the spins to satisfy one of the bonds, I end up frustrating another one of the bonds. So here, because I've added in these couplings in a random way, again, I have this problem where I don't have a unique ground state. I have a lot of different possible states, all either the same or very close in energy. And the question of even finding the ground state of this material becomes extremely complicated because I need to know the behavior of every single spin in the entire system. So let's just recolor this diagram that I showed you a second ago. So we had these random bonds, either plus or minus J in um, blue and orange. I'm just going to recolor this to show you the bonds that are satisfied in green and the bonds that are frustrated in red. And we're going to look at a lot of pictures like this from now on. So if the bond is green, the spins are aligned in a way that minimizes the energy. If the bond is red, the spins are aligned in a way that does not minimize the energy. And you can see here, a lot of these combinations of spins are not minimizing the energy. But if I were to flip one of the spins to satisfy, let's say, this bond, suddenly I would mess up all the other bonds around it. So we have to play this game. How can I distribute the spins in such a way that I, I frustrate the minimum number of bonds to get the low energy state, to get the ground state? 
And this is an immensely complex problem. There are a huge, huge number of configurations of spins that are very close in energy or even have exactly the same energies. So we've prepared this state here, this two-dimensional array of spins. We've prepared this in a way that minimizes the energy as best as we possibly can. Let's um, look at what happens if we start flipping some spins and let's see what happens to the energy of this whole array of spins. So let's take just a little portion of that lattice that I showed you already. Um, we can compute the energy of this. So every green line is a minus j, every red line is a plus j. If I got my math right, this should be a minus 12j configuration. Let's say I want to see if I start flipping some spins, can I lower the energy? Can I find a better ground state than the one that I prepared here? So let's say I want to flip this spin. If I do that, I find that this bond that was red now goes green. This bond is satisfied, but I mess up these two. These two are now frustrated. The energy of my system goes up. So we want a big negative energy here in the scale that we're working in. So minus 12 is lower than minus 10. This is not a good move. By flipping this spin, we increase the energy. We don't find a better ground state. We can keep playing this game. Let's say I want to flip this spin instead. I find exactly the same problem. I flip this spin, I satisfy this bond that was red, but now I frustrate another two bonds. I can do this again, I can pick another spin, and now it's even worse. Now, if I flip this spin, okay, I satisfy this bond that was red, but now I frustrate three bonds. So these random single spin flips that I try to make almost always are increasing the overall energy. They're taking me further away from my low energy ground state that I want to find. But we don't have to do single spin flips. We can do multiple. So you can see if I now flip this spin here, this spin here, which was previously all red, had three frustrated bonds, now has three green bonds. Now I've lowered the energy by quite a lot. And now in fact, I have found a much better ground state. I find a lower energy configuration than the one I started in. So I started from a configuration that was the lowest energy one that I could find. And then by flipping spins in a random way, I find that most spin flips increase the energy, but some of them, if I make enough spin flips, can decrease the energy again even further. Now we can draw this uh, process as a kind of cartoon. So if I plot you the energy versus number of spin flips, then Let's say we start over here, I make one random spin flip, chances are I'll probably increase the energy of my spin configuration. Maybe I make another flip, I increase it a little bit more, and maybe I find a good one that can really decrease the energy. What I find here is a thing called an energy landscape. And this energy landscape is pretty random looking. As I change individual spins, I can change the energy of my system by quite a large amount, and it's pretty random. There's no nice kind of clean pattern in here. And what we find is that in most physical systems, if you leave a system alone, it wants to go to the lowest energy states that it can find. And this is true for everything in everyday life, like a Newton's cradle or any kind of mechanical system. If you leave it alone long enough, it will try to reach the lowest energy state that it can. And now this is why spin glasses are very complex and very interesting because they have a lot of low energy states, a lot of possible states that they could evolve into when you leave these systems alone. But these low energy states are separated from each other by these very, very large energy barriers. So let's say I have a spin configuration that has this energy. Now there's another minimum over here that has almost exactly the same energy. So you might think, OK, I have two states that have the same energy. Statistical mechanics tells me that uh, if I compute some thermodynamic averages, well, I average over all equivalent states. This normally means all states that have the same energy. Uh, you know, there'd be some probability for my system maybe to transition from one state to another state with the same energy. It doesn't cost me anything. But in fact, here, to get from this configuration to this one, we need to climb this really large energy barrier. OK, to go from one state to another state with exactly the same energy, we need to go through a bunch of intermediate states which have higher energies. So that means that if I prepare my system in this configuration, unless I give it some energy, 
it can never escape. I need to give it somehow the energy to climb this barrier to evolve across a bunch of different configurations and then eventually end up here. So we call these dips in the energy landscape valleys. These valleys are separated by, we call them hills or mountains. And spin glasses basically get stuck in these valleys and they cannot move for very long periods of time. They behave quite differently to regular, what we'd call ergodic systems that are a bit more free to move around in their free energy landscape. Now, okay, I'm saying here that there is an energy barrier and that to get from one state to another, we need to give it energy. How, how would we do that? Uh, probably the easiest way to give a system energy is you couple it to an environment and you heat it up. If we heat our system, if we increase its temperature, we increase the kinetic energy of all the components and we can give our system enough energy to populate these excited states and eventually maybe reach a different part of our free energy landscape. And in fact, if we come back to our picture of spins on a lattice, you can imagine if I start heating these spins up, I'm giving them kinetic energy. They're going to start to move. And in fact, if I heat this thing up to a very, very high temperature, these spins are just going to start moving essentially randomly and freely. So to get a spin glass, to get a configuration where these spins are pinned in a random way and cannot change, I need to be at quite low temperatures. So at high temperatures, the spins are free to spin around. They can take different configurations. It doesn't matter. We call this a paramagnet. There's no magnetic order. And over time, the spins will change into different configurations. Spin glasses are what happen when you combine disorder and frustration at very low temperatures. The spins get stuck in a particular configuration. They get stuck in some, some way and then they get pinned in this configuration for very, very long times. They find it very hard to change into any different configurations. So spin glasses only exist at low temperatures in materials with disorder and with frustration. So the main ingredients for a spin glass are the frustration, which can either be from this geometric constraint of trying to put easing spins on a triangular lattice where they can only point up or down, or by adding in some kind of random disorder on a more regular square lattice. We need low temperatures because high temperature introduces thermal fluctuations that allows our spins to flip randomly. And then over long periods of time, the spins will take all sorts of different configurations. And we need this so-called, this complex, this rugged free energy landscape that I showed you on the previous slide, where the energy varies quite randomly when you make very small changes to the configuration of the system. Now, this guarantees that we trap our system in a particular state for a very long time. So on the previous slide, I showed you a little bit of a cartoon. Here's something a little bit more realistic. This is the free energy landscape on the left for a ferromagnetic system, on the right for a spin glass. Now, here, the ferromagnet has two possible ground states. We have all spins up or we have all spins down. Now, these states are separated by a small energy barrier, but you can see that the free energy plotted against the magnetization gives us this really nice, smooth curve. And you can quite clearly see that there are two very distinct possible minima for this system. The spin glass, on the other hand, is, is crazy. It's really, really random. It's really rough. It's really noisy. And there are a lot of possible minima here, which are either degenerate or very close to degenerate. So you can imagine that if I started a ferromagnetic system in a state that was over here, it could simply roll down this free energy landscape and find its minimum quite easily. If I start a spin glass system, if I initialize it in some entirely random state, it could get stuck at the bottom of one of these valleys. And over long periods of time, it can't move. So spin glasses exhibit this temporal order. They are frozen, a bit like atoms in a regular glass, how they are frozen in place in real space. In a spin glass, the spins are pinned in a random configuration and they can't move. Uh, we'll come back to this idea of the free energy landscape in a little while. But before we do, let's talk about how do we know if we have a spin glass or not? What's the, what's the telltale sign of a spin glass? What makes a spin glass different to any other magnetic phase? Because I've just told you that the spins are all fixed in a completely random configuration. So how do, we, how do we quantify this? How do you look at a random arrangement of spins and know what phase you're in? So 
Here, I give you these plots where I show you the spins and I can show you the bonds and I can tell you that some of these bonds are frustrated and some are satisfied. And then you can get some idea that, okay, by looking at the energetics, you can say, right, these may be spin glass phases. But if we have a real material and we don't know what all these bonds are, if I take the bonds away, you just have a random collection of spins. How do we look at these spins and say, this is a spin glass or this is a paramagnet or this is any kind of other magnetic phase? How do we distinguish the spin glass phase? So to do this, we have to remember that spin glasses have this so-called temporal order. If you are in a spin glass phase, you will remain fixed in that particular configuration for very long periods of time. So we don't want to be looking at any static order parameters. We want to be looking at non-equilibrium order parameters. We need to somehow generate some non-equilibrium dynamics and look at what happens to our system. If we add in, let's say, some finite temperature, if we add in some kind of small perturbation, what happens? Does our system remain basically unchanged for long periods of time? Or is it very easy to get all the spins to flip and to get the entire system to move into a new configuration? So the main way that we do this, at least theoretically, is called uh, quench dynamics. We prepare our system in some configuration, let's say at some particular temperature, and then we very suddenly change something. Now, this can be anything. This can be we change the temperature. It could be we change the couplings between the spins by applying some kind of magnetic field. It's any sudden change that just gives the system a little bit of a kick away from its equilibrium states and allows us to see what happens in time. What happens as we observe its dynamics? Does it stay close to its initial state? Or does it just freely evolve into some other completely random state? Now, we can make this a bit more precise by talking about things called order parameters. And there are two main things that uh, we use in spin glass physics to indicate that we have a spin glass as opposed to any kind of other phase. So the first one I want to introduce here is called the two-time correlation function. Now, for those of you, again, who are familiar with this sort of notation, uh, you might be quite familiar with how these behave. For those of you who maybe don't know this notation so well, what's happening here is I'm just looking at the orientation of a spin, sigma i, at some time t, compared with its orientation at some other time t prime, and then I'm just averaging this over all the spins on my lattice. So to give you an idea, a kind of intuitive feeling for how this behaves, let's pretend we have just one single spin. Let's say I have this spin at some time t, it's pointing up. At some later time t prime, it's also pointing up. Then the correlation between these spins is equal to one. They are maximally correlated. They are behaving in precisely the same way, okay? They're aligned, they're pointing in the same direction. If we allow for one moment the spin to point sideways, then let's say my spin at time t is still up, my spin at t prime is now pointing sideways. These spins are completely uncorrelated from each other. There is no resemblance at all between these two spins, so the correlation is zero. And if my spins are up at time t and then down at time t prime, these spins are anti-correlated, so the correlation is minus one. They're pointing in precisely the opposite direction to each other. So hopefully this gives you some idea about how, by looking at this correlation function, we get an idea of how do these spins behave in time? Do they remain very closely correlated or do they evolve in a way that uh, is essentially random and they end up uncorrelated from each other? Now, let me show you here uh, a couple of correlation functions from a real calculation. I'll give you a reference later on if you actually want to go into the details about how these are computed. But this is computed in a disordered spin model uh, for two different parameter values. And you can see that the correlation functions can behave in very, very different ways. And it's really important to understand the distinction between these two. So I want to spend a little minute discussing what you're actually seeing here. So again, the correlation function is close to one. That tells us that the spins are very closely correlated in time. The correlation function goes to zero. They are not correlated at all in time. And what you can see here in this image, I'm plotting you correlation functions here for two very different parameter values. And the different colors refer to different choices of this T prime. So here, the notation I'm using, it's called T weighting, TW. On the previous slide, this was a T prime. 
Um, black is a small T prime, red is a large T prime. You can see in this top plot here, I'm actually plotting something like 15 or 20 lines, and they're all basically on top of each other. And you can see this correlation function very, very quickly decays from 1 to 0. This tells us that the system is pretty much uncorrelated from its initial state very, very quickly. It forgets its initial state. It has no memory. This is a correlation function for a paramagnet. This is not a spin glass. This is like a high temperature phase where the spins are all allowed to orient themselves randomly and they can all keep moving as they wish. Um, paramagnets have no memory of their initial conditions at all, no correlation with the initial state. The bottom panel, though, shows you the correlation function in a spin glass. And you can see a couple of really significant differences. So for one thing, all of these different choices of TW, we call it the waiting time, produce completely different curves. They're all doing different things. And as I increase TW, as I go from black to red, you can see the correlation function approaches this kind of plateau here. It stays very, very close to one. That tells me that as I look at the behavior of this correlation function in time, it stays close to one. My spins stay very, very closely correlated with each other, even as I look at very, very long times. Now that tells me that I'm in a spin glass phase because the spins are stuck in some configuration. They can't move. I give them a kick. I give them a little bit of finite temperature. I hit them with a magnetic field. It doesn't matter. After some initial small relaxation process, the spins basically are still stuck in that state for a very long time. Spin glasses, in that sense, have a memory of their initial conditions. They remember where they were started, and they remain very, very closely correlated to that initial state, in contrast to something like a paramagnet, which very quickly forgets how you initially prepared it. Now, we can make this a little bit more formal. So again, apologies for including math, but we can formalize this by introducing a thing called the Edwards-Anderson order parameter. Now, it's related to the correlation function in the limits of t prime to infinity and t minus t prime to infinity. What this means, if I come back to these correlation function pictures, is that if I plot my correlation function, if there is a plateau in the correlation function, that fixes the value of q. So here, I'm showing you the correlation function for uh, spin glass at a variety of different temperatures. There are a lot of different things on this plot. Don't worry too much about all the details. The important thing to look at here are these four curves are the correlation function for a spin glass at four different temperatures. Blue are colder temperatures, red are warmer temperatures. And we can see at cold temperatures, as I change the waiting time, that's what these dash and dotted lines are, the correlation function approaches this plateau. So here, the value of Q, the order parameter, is the height of this plateau. So at the lowest temperature and the second lowest temperature, my correlation function looks like it's starting to reach a plateau in the long time limit. At higher temperatures, though, I see nothing interesting. The correlation function just decays, and it goes straight to 0. So this tells me that in this particular material, which you can check out the reference here if you want the details, I have a spin glass phase emerging at low temperatures, and I have a paramagnetic phase emerging at higher temperatures. So between the correlation function, between the dynamics of the correlation function, and looking for the emergence of this plateau, we can characterize a spin glass phase and distinguish a spin glass from any other kind of phase. So, so far I've given, I hope, some kind of intuition about uh, what a spin glass phase actually is, how it looks in terms of the spins and some of the, some of the math, some of the order parameters that we want to look at to quantify if we have a spin glass. I haven't told you how we actually compute these. And this is the point where we have to turn back to Parisi, who we mentioned at the very beginning, and talk about what it is that he did that was worthy of a Nobel Prize. Because I hope I've, I've conveyed to you that studying these systems is incredibly complicated. We have all these different spins. We have all these different random bonds between them. So many different configurations that these things could take. Trying to do some kind of pen and paper math with this is, is a nightmare. There is so much complexity that we have to take into account. And a large part of what Parisi did was figuring out ways that we could do exactly that. We can take into account this complexity and make practical calculations. So 
Again, for those of you who know something about uh, thermodynamics, maybe you're familiar with some of these expressions. For those of you who are not, don't worry too much about the details. But if you're wanting to compute the thermodynamic properties of some material, one important quantity is the free energy. This is what I showed you on this um, free energy landscape on a couple of the slides. The free energy is given by logarithm of the partition function, which is itself related to the Hamiltonian. I showed you the Hamiltonian earlier. That's the thing that counts the energy of the configurations that we're in. And this is traced over all possible configurations. Now, if you want to understand the behavior of spin glasses, what you need to do is disorder average the free energy. We need to average this over all possible choices of, uh, of disordered configurations, all possible random arrangements of the bonds. And this is actually really, really hard. Um, doing the disorder average of the logarithm of this partition function, you can probably see just by looking at it, this is, this is a really complex expression. And if you try and do this by hand, just brute force, it gets very messy very quickly. One of the things that Parisi is most famous for, at least in my field, is a thing called the replica trick, which just involves saying, okay, let's take this logarithm, this log z up here, and there's a mathematical identity, an exact identity that says you can rewrite log z as z to the n minus one over n in the limit of n going to zero. Now, okay, you might say, so what? Uh, <laughs> I'm just changing the logarithm into something that looks just as complicated. Turns out though that it's not. Doing the disorder average of the logarithm is a very hard problem. But this bit on the right hand side, now we just have z to the power of n. Now we just have to disorder average n copies of our partition function. These copies are known as replicas. And this, this formulation, this relatively simple identity, changes the game and it allows us to actually calculate properties of spin glasses. So to turn back to some pictures here for a moment, let's say I want to compute the logarithm of my partition function, which is the logarithm of the trace over all these different configurations of spins. This is very difficult. But if I use this replica trick, all I have to compute is a product of n partition functions. And actually, if you go through the math of it all, the way to understand this is that each of these different partition functions, each of these different replicas, as we call them, takes a different spin configuration. So physically speaking, log of the partition function, that doesn't mean a huge amount to me. But here, if we take n replicas, you take a bunch of copies of your system, every one prepared in a different possible configuration. And then when you're doing all this disorder averaging, you're really just summing up all the possible configurations of your system and doing some kind of weighted average. Now, for the experts involved, um, if you do this in a path integral formalism, you're actually doing a configurational integral over all these possibilities of fields. But loosely, physically speaking, what you're just doing is creating n copies of your system, each in a different configuration, and you're averaging across them all to get the overall behavior of your spin glass system. This, this trick really changed everything, and it allowed people to analytically, to by hand, to write down expressions for the energy of spin glasses, the dynamics of spin glasses, and get a handle on this infinite complexity. It does turn out, though, it doesn't completely work all of the time. Sometimes if you use this trick, you end up with things like negative entropies or results that don't make an awful lot of sense. So there's an extra trick that Parisi developed called replica symmetry breaking. Now, replica symmetry breaking is... Uh, is a pretty complicated thing to discuss without getting into the math, and I don't want to get into the maths in, in a huge amount of detail. So instead, I want to appeal to your physical intuition again by comparing spin glasses to ferromagnets. I showed you this plot already. This is the free energy of a ferromagnet versus its magnetization. It has two ground states, all spins up and all spins down. Now, if you want to compute the thermodynamic average of this, let's say you want to compute the average magnetization of this thing, you don't average over all the up states and all the down states, because that would tell you that on average you have zero magnetization and you don't have a magnet. What you actually do is you normally apply some kind of small symmetry breaking field and you restrict your average to one, one spin sector. 
So the point here is that in most systems, you do not just average the properties across every minimum in your free energy landscape. Otherwise, you will get unphysical results. Now, we do this in a spin glass. We do exactly the same thing here. You don't want to average a spin glass over all its possible minima, because if you do, just like in the ferromagnet, you end up with unphysical results. Now, in the ferromagnet, these two minima are related by symmetry. So mathematically, you add a small symmetry breaking field, and that solves the problem. In a spin glass, these minima are pretty much random. There is no symmetry relation, no physical symmetry relation. So you need some way to restrict your averages to just the physically useful minima. And that is called replica symmetry breaking. It's not a physical symmetry. It's a, a symmetry in replica space. Now, uh, I, I'm not going to go into the full details of the mass of this. And I think we're running a little short on time. So I'm going to just stop there with that kind of physical picture. The ferromagnet, um, you don't average overall minima in the ferromagnetic space. Same deal in the spin glass. What Parisi really did here is that he found a way to structure this. It's called the replica symmetry breaking or the Parisi hierarchical scheme. Basically, he found a way to group all of these degenerate states, all these possible configurations, all these energy minima in a way that um, allows you to calculate with them. It restricts your averages to small parts of the free energy landscape, and it gives you back physically realistic results. Now, as I say, I'm not going to go into the full details for that. I'm going to point you towards, among other things, to my PhD thesis or to the book by Parisi Mizar Virasaro, which uh, goes into a lot of detail about the physics behind these tricks and why they work. But at this point, let me just say it's mathematically, it's very complicated and it's kind of amazing that anyone managed to come up with this scheme in the first place. It's a way of taming the infinite complexity in a spin glass and allowing us to make real calculations that give us real results. What it hinges on here is just remembering that these uh, different spin glass states are separated by very, very large energy barriers. If the state cannot climb an energy barrier to get from one state to another, then you don't include that in the averaging. Once you've done this, once you've developed replica symmetry breaking and these other tricks, suddenly you can get a really long way with spin glasses. You can start to solve a lot of problems in spin glasses and start to really understand the behavior of these materials. But if that was all it was, then that would be really interesting, but perhaps not worthy of a Nobel Prize. Why this is worthy of a Nobel Prize is that it doesn't stop here. It doesn't stop with solid state systems, with magnetic uh, magnetic atoms in a, in a solid but it extends to a much wider range of other physical systems. So the perhaps simplest one straight away are other types of quantum glasses, where instead of having the glassiness in the magnetic degrees of freedom, you can have it, for example, in the superfluid phase or in the density distribution of ultracold atomic gases. I've done a bit of work on this. I'll just give you a couple of references here as an advert. But it also has a lot of relevance outside of, outside of um, condensed matter physics entirely. So it turns out that the problem of solving the ground state of a spin glass, of finding the best minimum among all these possible configurations, is actually exactly the same as the problems that you solve in neural networks and machine learning. So in these systems, it's mathematically identical. You, have, um, you represent machine learning problem as a very complex free energy landscape. And you have to find the minimum in that free energy landscape. You can use the tricks developed by Parisi for spin glasses to do that. So that's exactly what people do in machine learning. And in fact, you can go beyond machine learning and you can talk about not just neural networks, but actual living brains using spin glass physics. It's kind of incredible that we go from spins in solid state to understanding the behavior of, of living creatures. And we can push that even further too. It turns out that the problem of protein folding can also be mapped onto a spin glass problem. Protein folding is when complex molecules, proteins, take a very particular specific shape that allows them to undergo certain chemical reactions. Finding the correct shape is, again, a really tough problem. And it also maps exactly onto finding the ground state of a spin glass. So the techniques developed by Parisi to understand these spin glasses 
have a huge, huge range of applications and all kinds of other physical systems. Now, to wrap up, I'm just going to give you a quick advert for some of the work that I do. Um, I work on spin glasses and low dimensional systems. So one of the things that I didn't really mention so far is that most of the work we do on spin glasses is in the, the infinite dimensional limit. We work with mean field models where all the spins are connected to every other one. If you represent that as a cartoon here for 16 spins, every spin is connected to every other one. You can see there are a huge number of couplings. If you randomize these couplings, you can see pretty quickly this is a highly frustrated system and you get a spin glass phase. But it's not very realistic in an experimental setting. Experiments tend to work in low dimensions and one, two, and three dimensional materials. And in these systems, you require, usually you require long range interactions between the spins to kind of mimic this configuration. If you have long range interactions here in this phase diagram measured by this parameter sigma, essentially having long range interactions is a bit like having a higher dimensional system. So you can make some connection between these mean field simulations and short, uh, short range spin glasses and low dimensional systems. But there's still a lot of work to be done here. There's a lot of scope for new and interesting physics to emerge. And in particular in low dimensional systems and one and 2D systems, quantum fluctuations are very, very strong. Now quantum fluctuations can do one of two things. They can either increase the localization of your system or they can do exactly the opposite. They can decrease it and delocalize your system. So one big open question that we have is, most of what I've talked about so far were classical spin glasses. What happens if we start adding in quantum fluctuations? Do we enhance spin glass behavior? Do we destroy spin glass behavior? Or do we find something new entirely, some kind of many body localized spin glass, something a bit different? And for that, I'm just going to say, Watch this space, that's what I'm working on at the moment. That's what a lot of people are working on at the moment. It's a really complex and interesting problem that is kind of pushing all of these techniques developed by Parisi and others into very, very complex quantum systems. And there's a lot more work to be done on these, a lot of very interesting things that we can look at. So with that, I'm gonna wrap up. Uh, hopefully I have conveyed to you that spin glasses are incredibly complicated systems. They have a complex interplay between the disorder, frustration, and many body interactions. They're very challenging theoretically. Here I give you a couple of references if you want more about replica symmetry breaking, more in the dynamics, uh, how we actually compute these things, or a little bit of work from me on quantum fluctuations. I've told you a little bit about how you can experimentally see if you have a spin glass, these slow, re slow relaxation dynamics, and a bunch of other interesting nonlinear responses that you can see in experiments, which I didn't really mention here. I've told you a little bit about the mathematical tools that people use to study these systems, and really we only scratched the surface. There are other ones developed even by Parisi, such as cavity methods, which are still very widely used. And right at the end there, I gave you a bit of an advert for some of the ongoing work in spin glasses, which is understanding how they behave in the presence of quantum fluctuations. So with that, I think I will leave it there. Thank you very much for your attention, and I would be delighted to take any questions that you have. Yeah, so thank uh, thank you for your talk, Stephen. Uh, I must say now I feel slightly older because I can understand slightly. <laughs> I don't know if this is a good thing or a bad thing. I'm sorry for making you feel older, but... Uh... <laughs> yeah, but uh, it's what it is. It's what it is. So thank you. And it was a very interesting talk and a lot of uh, complex concepts explained in a very lucid manner. So thanks for that. We already have two questions. So uh, we have uh, Sonu who had actually raised his hand during the talk. So Sonu, you can go ahead with your question. Okay, hi sir. Thank you for the nice talk. And uh, I have a question if you consider uh, the classical model, which you showed that there, if we fluctuate the num number of spins, there will be different number of valleys and the uh, system will be uh, trapped in those valleys. And there mm -hmm. is a, there's a temporal coherence and uh, that system, if uh, there is consider there is a valley A, B and C, and if it is uh, trapped in valley A, and if we give some fluctuation, we give some perturbation, then it can move to uh, B if we neglect the uh, this quantum tunneling. Okay. So my question is, if suppose the, uh, the system is trapped in valley A and we gave some perturbation to the system, for example, in the form of magnetic field, 
mm-hmm. and it goes to valley b but uh, the valley a and valley b are all together different in terms of their spin configuration so uh, is it it doesn't like create a paradox that uh, a same system uh, is in different states with when we are giving fluctuations uh, we are giving some extra perturbation and the system behaves all together differently in different valleys because their spin configuration is uh, different yeah so if the system is allowed to jump from one valley to another then in principle it will keep jumping right it will jump from one to another and there will be let's say there could be a large number of configurations which all have the same energy but a completely different spin configuration so if i allow my system to evolve if i give it a perturbation i watch the non-equilibrium dynamics the system will jump from one to another to another and it will kind of move between these different valleys so if you look at something like these correlation functions what you'll find is that they will decay to zero because on average your system is no longer correlated with its initial state right the average behavior is given by an average over all these possible different configurations so if the system can jump between the valleys then it will pretty quickly stop being a spin glass and turn into a paramagnetic phase spin but what if we yeah that is uh, that i uh, that is uh, like correctly explained but what if we remove the perturbation when the system is in valley a and it jumps to valley b and now we remove the per- perturbation for, for example magnetic field for mm-hmm. uh, to say so what will happen then then this correlation function will not go to zero oh exactly yeah 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 what you've done there is you've moved it into a different valley but then if you remove the perturbation then you have a spin glass again in the different valley but that will be all together different configuration na no? spin configuration yeah 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 exactly it will be and the system will be have differently like if it is its spin configuration is different then system will behave differently na no? it will behave differently so i guess there you need to distinguish when you're talking about the correlation function do you mean the correlation between the initial states and the new states which could be extremely small but if you look at the correlation function at two times after it's jumped into the new valley then that correlation function will be close to 1 does okay. that make sense yeah yeah thank you thanks uh, thanks ono uh, arvin yeah hi uh steven thanks for your for your nice talk um since i'm an engineer i have a very practical question um okay. i don't know maybe i have even missed it i was a little bit on and off during the talk but are there any applications that we could imagine where we could really use this spin spin glasses in in industrial applications or in daily life applications so <laughs> For spin glasses, I'm not so sure about industrial applications. Um, for glasses, in the more general sense, in terms of structural glasses, yes, they're quite interesting in terms of the. I want to say metallurgical properties, but this is getting very far from my area of expertise. For glasses, in a more general sense, yes, there are industrial manufacturing applications. For spin glasses, in particular, they're interesting. I guess from the theoretical point of view, for the reasons that I mentioned. I find them interesting from a possible practical point of view because spin glasses are very very robust phases. I mentioned that they have this memory. You give them some small perturbation and in general they don't move very far from their initial state. Now, this is really desirable for let's say quantum computers or for storage of quantum memories. Um a big problem we have in quantum computing is decoherence if you prepare some spin configuration let's say you know spin up and spin down or like your ones and zeros you really want that material to stay in that configuration for long enough for you to do your computation or come back and retrieve this state from the memory there are a couple of ways that we can try to achieve this um spin glasses i think are a very promising way of doing this so that's why i'm interested in connecting quantum fluctuations with spin glasses i want to try and store quantum information in these spin glass configurations which hopefully will remain there for a very long time and hopefully will be a robust form of quantum memory i'm not sure if that's a practical application in any kind of near term realistic sense but it's one possible uh, real world application for this and it's the reason a lot of people are still studying these quite actively no thanks a lot i yeah that is in fact yeah i can imagine if if we have applications in quantum computing then um that is where i'm i'm heading towards yeah so 
who knows, maybe in 20, 30 years, then spin glasses will be just used in normal co or in then available quantum computers, right? That's, that's the dream. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. So thanks a lot, yeah. That was my question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions from our listeners? Yes, please. Sheet. Hello. Am I audible? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, my question is that spin, uh, spinning glass phase arises due to geometrical frustration disorder and other factors. So how on applying the external magnetic field, the spinning glass phase suppressed? Because spinning glass is the kind of spin freezing in random direction. So how, when we apply external magnetic field, the spin freezing is lost and even suppressed to lower temperature. Okay, so the question is, what happens to a spin glass if I apply a magnetic field? Is that the question? Yes, and why it's suppressed to lower temperature? Um, so if you apply a magnetic field, that behaves in usually in a similar way as um, increasing the temperature. So applying a magnetic field gives the spins a little bit more energy, right? They gain energy by aligning with the field. If the field is strong enough, they will align with the field rather than satisfying the bonds with their nearest neighbors. So imagine if you apply an infinitely strong field, then the spins don't care anymore about the coupling between the spins. They'll all align exactly with the field. So if you apply a strong enough field, you will destroy spin glass order. And then if you remove the field again afterwards, then you should expect the system to kind of equilibrate into another different spin glass phase. Does so that can we answer the question? That, can we say that when we apply high magnetic field, the spin align in a particular direction, like in the direction of magnetic field, but spin freezing is all still there? Um, the spins will align, uh, the spins will be frozen only in a kind of trivial way in the sense that they're, they're aligned with the field. At that point, you will lose all this kind of aging dynamics and really then you'll just have a, a ferromagnetic state. It's only... Yeah, it's only really when the the frustrated bonds are dominating the physics. That's when we have a spin glass. If you apply a very strong field, then you'll break the spin glass and you'll end up in essentially a conventional ferromagnet again. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, hi. Uh no, wait, so yeah. just one second. Sorry, no question. Yeah, okay, sir. Uh, it was a nice talk, uh, Dr. Thompson. So I have a small question. Like uh, you know, in this Paris's model that he discussed different sort of spin freezing, right? Spins are getting freezer, frozen, that, and uh, there's a correlation time with respect to that. But uh, for the spin glass, we had uh, some characteristics parameter within the spin freezing. In many cases, we have a spin freezing, but it is not of a spin glass type. The system has to follow a certain law, say Arrhenius law or some minus parameter, when nice to check it. So mm -hmm. in this model, where do we distinguish from a spin freezing? Any ordinary spin freezing to the spin glass freezing? I think, um, I think where you will see this is in the aging dynamics. So I'm not completely sure it's not something i've looked at myself but i believe if you look at the behavior of the correlation functions at different wait times that should distinguish glassy dynamics which display aging from any other type of spin freezing which uh, the spins are frozen trivially and then they don't um, exhibit this kind of rich dynamical behavior so i think the answer to your question is that you look at the correlation functions and you really need to look for the presence or absence of aging effects and uh, under spectral things in your uh, free energy diagram, right? this is free energy with respect to the order parameter. Right? So, yeah. order parameter is the correlation time. Uh, yeah, so the free energy I was drawing for spin glasses was a bit of a cartoon there. Um, plotting against the magnetization, magnetization is not a good order parameter in these systems. Um, so, yeah, I, that was a bit of a cartoon. That was a little bit of a a little bit of a cheat in there just to try to get some physical intuition across. The best order parameter for a spin glass really is this Edwards Anderson order parameter, which is related to the, the infinite system size limit and then the long time limit behavior of the correlation function and whether it reaches a plateau or whether it vanishes to zero. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you
That's the best order parameter that we have for spin glasses. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I have a question from Dheeraj. So Dheeraj, could you please? Uh, hello, uh, hello, sir. Uh, so I want to also ask a question about that low dimensionality. So when we uh, when we talk about low dimensionality, so quantum fluctuations are the intrinsic nature in a low dimensional system. So uh, if particularly we have to consider a system, so do we need to, do we also need to take into account the uh, spin magnitude? Means whether we should it take a system with low spin or a high spin system? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you take into account the spin magnitude, but it doesn't lead to any particularly dramatic qualitative changes. As long as, long as there is spin, then it doesn't really matter if it's spin half, spin one. Um, qualitatively, it will behave similarly. And in fact, a lot of the mean field approximations, they don't work with exact spins. They work with what are called spherical spins, where instead of forcing every spin to behave like a quantum spin, you allow them to behave in a certain way constrained by some Lagrange multiplier that means that on average they behave like quantum spins but individually they may not so yeah that's just to say that qualitatively speaking the magnitude of the spin doesn't make a huge difference to what we see now if you're looking at particles that don't have spin at all let's say you're looking at spinless bosons in an ultra cold atom lattice or something there you can still see glassy effects but it's a little bit different so instead of seeing um like magnetic frustration, if you have no spin, the, you have no magnetic field of the bosons. What you end up finding is the material can break into little different superfluid pockets and every pocket has a different superfluid phase. And then you end up with a kind of phase frustration. You can use a lot of the same techniques to describe these. Uh, that's what I've, I did a lot of my PhD work on it. In fact. It's a little bit harder to get a, a physical intuition and a geometric understanding of these phases, but at its heart, the same physics is also true for these spinless systems with disorder. Uh, and sir, uh, uh, also when the quantum fluctuation uh, will be dominating, so uh, how then uh, spins can freeze, freeze in a random direction in that case? Because quantum fluctuation will lead to the spins to fluctuate. So quantum fluctuations can have a couple of different roles. Um, the kind of intuitive one, perhaps, is that they allow you to tunnel between these different minima in the energy landscape. Okay, Quantum tunneling allows us to jump from one phase to another one in a way that would be classically forbidden. But there is a secondary effect, which is that if you imagine a particle scattering off uh, like a random potential, it can reflect off the random potential and you can get destructive interference. So quantum fluctuations can actually lead to particles becoming localized. In the case of spins, what this means is that quantum fluctuations can actually pin a spin in a particular orientation because of the interference effect from the wave function scattering from the disorder. This, in a non-interacting non system, would be called Anderson localization. And once you start adding interactions, it's called many-body localization. Now, th these forms of localization are not, strictly speaking, glassiness. These occur in low dimensional systems and it's a very, very strong form of spin freezing. For example, you don't have any of these aging effects. It's still an open question. It's one that I'm working on at the moment. How do you connect these strong low dimensional localization effects to more conventional spin glasses? So to answer the question of how do, what do quantum fluctuations actually do in these spin glasses in low dimensional systems? That's a really active area of investigation. And to be honest, we don't completely know yet. We're still working on it. Thank you. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll just take uh, one more question. So, Kostov, uh, you have a question? Hello, Sriven. Nice talk. Uh, I have just one question. Um, that uh, this uh, parses, uh, parses model is connected to the hierarchical model of spin glasses, right? Yes, yes. I think it's, in fact, the same thing. I just didn't really use the word hierarchical. Yes. Uh -huh. So... Yeah, but in many cases, uh, it has been reported that uh, spin glasses follow droplet model, right? So how can we relate both? Uh, I'm not so familiar with the droplet model. I think I know that more from sort of soft condensed matter, more like structural glasses and percolation transitions. Okay. Uh, 
Yeah, I don't think I can really comment on that in detail. All I can because, say is that because this droplet model basically connects that uh, instead of a multi valley structure, we have a one large valley and mm -hmm. Uh, the interaction takes between the, the springs which are residing in those uh, large valleys instead of a multi valley structure. And uh, more commonly, this drop blade model is sometimes used for some uh, spring glasses. Means I'm talking um, from the viewpoint of experiments. <laughs> okay, okay, I see. Yeah. So um, this this multi valley structure, this is called ultra matricity. Um, in the calculations, you end up with this free parameter that kind of fixes the, the size of the valleys or the number of the valleys, if you like. So what I would guess here is that maybe the droplet model comes out of the Parisi model with a particular choice for the size of the valley. So for example, there's a thing called one-step replica symmetry breaking, which is one of the most commonly used variants of replica symmetry breaking. And um, this basically says, the, the spin configurations within a valley will talk to each other, but they do not talk to configurations outside of their valley at all. Um, I suspect perhaps the droplet model can emerge as some kind of limiting case of the one-step replica symmetry breaking, but that's a guess. I'm not familiar oh, yeah. enough with the droplet model to be able to say in detail. Sorry. Okay, okay thank you. Yeah. So uh, thank you, Stephen, again for your uh, wonderful talk. So I know a bit more about spin physics now. I'll start reading your papers. And so you can expect a lot of emails from me. And uh, perhaps uh, some of the people, I, I see people are still raising their hands. But in, in the interest of time, uh, perhaps uh, those who still have questions can reach you uh, some format. Uh, and uh, they can write an email to you at some point, if that's OK. With yes, you. absolutely. Please do. I'd love to hear from you. You can reach me by email. I'm stephen.thompson at fuberlin.de, or uh, you can reach me on Twitter or various other places. Um, yeah. yeah, please do. Great, great. It was a wonderful, engaging conversation. So thank you again, Stephen. And I hope that we can meet uh, in person at some point in time. And you also, uh, I hope so, too. I hope so, too. Thank you for having me. It's been great. Okay. Thank you. See you. Bye. Nice talk. Bye. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I just stopped the recording.